Hello everybody, my name is Kevin Lambert and I am privileged to be one of the paramedic practice educators on Vancouver Island. And I am very happy to have this opportunity to talk to the paramedics on the island. Um, first, I was hoping this would be a good chance to try out some comedy routines, maybe, uh, you know, debut a song or something like that, but um, I was told that's not going to happen. So. Anyways, I thought that we would stick to a topic that will be endorsed, and that is the topic of trauma. So there's a few changes coming to how we deal with trauma on the island, and these changes will apply to some paramedics, maybe not all, but I think it's important that we all have an idea of how trauma is operating on the island so that we can work together to take the best care of the patients. And because we have a somewhat transient workforce, where you work today might not be where you work in six months. And so it's good to have an idea of how trauma works on the island in general. So we're going to break it down into uh, two parts. This video is part one. And in this part, we are going to start off with a brief review of trauma. We're just going to talk about trauma in general and uh, just refresh ourselves on some of the things that go into defining trauma and making decisions. The next thing we're going to get into is to define a lead trauma hospital. And we'll take a look at the different levels of hospitals, uh, especially on the island, and break down just what that means and start to understand why we want to get our patients to higher level lead trauma hospitals if possible. Following that, we're going to get into the actual change coming to acceptable transport times for patients on the island. And following that, we will have a little discussion on just a couple of quick um, tools or thoughts or mindsets maybe um, to help in potentially prolonged transport situations where you're with a major trauma patient for a prolonged period of time. So with that, I think we will go ahead and jump right in to our brief review of trauma. So in dealing with our brief look at trauma, we're going to start to reference the 2019 provincial guideline that was put out um, in a joint effort between BCEHS and Trauma Services BC. And this basically gives us a pre-hospital triage and transport guidelines for our major trauma patients. And while it provides guidelines for where we should be taking people in terms of lead trauma hospital status, it doesn't speak to everywhere in the province. And that's what we're doing here, is we're basically taking these guidelines and applying them to Vancouver Island in a way that they make sense and will hopefully get uh, people where they need to be. Now, one of the first questions we have to ask ourselves uh, in going to a, a trauma patient is, how do I know if this patient fits the guidelines or not? Should this patient be transported to a lead trauma hospital under the guidelines? And the way to look at this is broken down in these guidelines quite well in a way that's pretty common across North America, actually. The first thing we do is we take our trauma patient and they could be injured from anything. It's not specific. It could be a, a motor vehicle incident. It could be, you know, a motorcyclist, a crash. It could be a long fall down a cliff. It could be, you know, um, something with a rhinoceros. I don't know. But there, people injure themselves in weird and wonderful ways. And the, how it happens isn't really the main point at this part. As long as there's something to satisfy, hey, yeah, this is a trauma patient, the first thing we want to look at is how is that patient physiologically impacted? So what we want to see is we want to see quickly, take a look at their vital signs, take a look at the mechanism. And what we're looking for in the adult trauma patient is we're looking for a GCS of less than or equal to 13, we're looking for a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, a respiratory rate less than 10 or greater than 30, or the need for ventilatory support. Now, these are pretty broad categories, but when you combine them with whatever happens, you responded to a collision on the highway or a long fall or whatever it might be, and you have a patient that's displaying these signs, these are quite predictive of somebody who probably has a serious injury that will need treatment at a lead trauma hospital. And just to quickly touch on the pediatric side of things, 
It's very similar. It's a GCS of less than or equal to 13. But instead of being specific about the blood pressure and the respiratory rate, we just look at abnormal vital signs for that age range, which we'll have to uh, have to look up and hopefully get um, get a bit of a heads up on the way to the call to be able to have those numbers rattling around in our head. So this is the first thing we want to look at. If, if our patient is traumatically injured and they have these physiological signs, transport to a lead trauma hospital is warranted. If those don't apply, say their GCS is 15, say their blood pressure is 95, whatever the case may be, the next thing we do is we want to look at um, the anatomical findings. So this, these are things we find on our RBS and on our, on our um, physical exam. And we're looking for a fairly extensive list of things. And this one gets a little long, but it's not too hard to keep in mind uh, when you actually take the time to look at what it is. And I think that most of us would intuitively go, hmm, wow, this patient's uh, fairly injured and could probably require a lead trauma hospital. So what we're looking for is we're looking for things like an open or depressed skull fracture, um, paralysis or neuro deficits, uh, major penetrating injuries anywhere above the elbows or knees and into the obviously the trunk and chest and head. Um, facial air, facial uh, or airway injury um, with airway compromise two or more proximal long bone fractures, so bilateral femur fractures or bilateral humerus fractures, any uh, crushed, degloved, mangled, pulseless extremity, amputations uh, proximal to the wrist or ankle, uh, chest wall instability or deformity, and then major burns greater than 20% um, or greater than 10% of full thickness burns. Or I would even add, um, you know, to the uh, high impact uh, areas you really don't want hurt, right? Like groins, necks, uh, face, um, or high voltage electrical burns, and, or mechanically unstable pelvic fractures. Now that's a pretty long list of things for the anatomical side, but it's certainly worth reviewing. And I think that most of these are fairly intuitive. I think that people on call, if they found one of these injuries would sort of think to themselves, huh, if this was me, I'd like to be in a lead trauma hospital. And you're right, you would. So this is something to um, keep in mind, even if they're not physiologically there, if they have these anatomical signs, these are people you wanna to take to a lead trauma hospital. Because when we get our first set of vital signs, uh, just to reflect back on the physiology and combine it with this part, it's important to remember that all we've really done is established a baseline at that point. We have one data point. We don't have two or three or four blood pressures or a trend looking at, at how this person is changing. And it could be depending on our response time or, or that patient's um, you know, uh, own physiology, they just might not be presenting with their shock yet. And that's not to say that they won't get sicker with their you know, chest injury or with their in state unstable pelvis or with their open or depressed skull fracture. So it's important to recognize these anatomical signs and realize that they need to go to a lead trauma hospital as well even if they don't fit the physiological criteria we mentioned above. So those two are fairly cut and dry. Um, the next thing we get into considering is step three, and that's, that's the mechanism of injury. And the mechan mechanism of injury needs to be evaluated, obviously, in any trauma. I think we look at this all the time. We try to get a sense of what happened. And we kind of want to consider certain cases as being potentially more serious than others. And this isn't a guess. This is stuff that comes out of looking at data and trauma registries and, and looking at the um, purported mechanism of injury and saying, hey, yeah, when we look back on it, people who fit this category, a number of them ended up having serious injury. And that's why they would warrant transport to a lead trauma hospital. So what we look at here is we look at things like falls, long falls. We look at high risk uh, car crashes, right? Um, intrusion, ejection. Uh, if there's a death in the vehicle compartment, even though your patient might seem okay. Uh, if it's a ped struck greater than 30K or a motorcyclist um, greater than 30 kilometers an hour. These are cases where people are at high risk for injury. And this is also where a bit of judgment and nuance starts to come into play because you can attend these situations and your patient might be up and walking around or chatting on their cell phone or whatever the case may be. And so sometimes it's hard to reconcile why you would take that patient to a lead trauma hospital uh, if they seem to be fine. And the, the whole point is that this is just an abundance of caution. 
This is a recognition that our on-scene evaluation is only so good. We don't really know what the trajectory of that patient is going to be. And oftentimes there is, there is um, a bit of a denial from these patients as well after this happens, where they might not acknowledge some of the injuries or pain that they're feeling that might be the most sensitive sign that there's something wrong. So these patients should, quote unquote, should be transported to a lead trauma hospital, but there could be cases where this just really might not be practical or even necessary. In this case, it is definitely recommended that uh, you give a call to clinical and talk to a PS or talk to EPOS and run this by them, run by the mechanism, run by the vital signs or what you're finding and sort of see uh, if they have anything to offer you in terms of <clears throat> helping you consider where an injury might lie that you just haven't been able to detect yet and if transport to the lead trauma hospital is warranted. So step four uh, is just special considerations. So despite what we found, I think physiological criteria is fairly fairly simple, right? GCS less than 13, um, you know, blood pressure less than 90, respiratory rate less than 10 or greater than 30, or a need for ventilatory support. That's pretty obvious if you have a, if you have a traumatic mechanism that those patients should go to a lead trauma hospital. Anatomically, I think those are, again, pretty obvious. You look at your mechanism, you look at those anatomical findings, and I think a lead trauma hospital kind of makes sense, and that's where we should be heading. And then the mechanism we just talked about is a you know, uh, it might be worth having a conversation with somebody and seeing where we should go. Or if you're, uh, you know what, don't disregard a spotty sense. If you think that these guys need to go to a lead trauma hospital, then by all means, uh, do it. And I think that that's a, a reasonable decision and one that's borne out by, um, by your judgment. And don't be afraid of getting, uh, of, of getting in trouble or anything like that from making a decision to go to a lead trauma hospital on mechanism. Um, over triage is certainly expected and what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we get the patients that really need it to the lead trauma hospitals and if that means taking four, five, ten patients who don't really need to be there to a lead trauma hospital to make sure that we get that one that does that's that's an acceptable statistic um, so yeah special considerations this is where we want to consider uh, older patients the elderly we want to consider pediatric patients uh, we want to consider patients who are anticoagulated or might have bleeding disorders. And we want to consider patients with burns or, um, or uh, pregnant patients. I think that it, combining this with the mechanism, if you don't have a physiological or an anatomical reason to go to a lead trauma hospital, when you look at the mechanism, keeping the thought in the back of your mind of these special considerations is reasonable because you might be leaning towards just going to a local hospital with your person who came off the motorbike at 40 kilometers an hour. But if that person is elderly on blood thinners, uh, hit their helmets, uh, or per maybe they're uh, uh, pregnant, it might be worth considering taking these patients to a lead trauma hospital because should something come of that uh, injury, it could potentially be worse for that uh, subset of patients. So we're gonna jump into what lead trauma hospital designation is and what it means and why it matters to us on the island. I just uh, finished reviewing and editing the last segment. So in order to wake myself up, I'm just gonna have a little sip of tea. Delicious. And we'll jump into talking about what a lead trauma hospital is. So this is a designation that's put out there to help us understand what each level of hospital brings and why we should attempt to bring our most seriously injured patients to a specific hospital. It's pretty simply ranked from one to five where a level one lead trauma hospital is kind of the granddaddy hospital with the most services all the way down to level five, which is basically there for initial stabilization and subsequent transfer out. This, these hospitals are, are designated into these levels by Accreditation Canada and the trauma distinction uh, standards that they use which were developed in collaboration with the Trauma Association of Canada to bring about standards and, and allow us to rank these hospitals from one to five, which helps give, give us a good idea of how to build a system to get patients to the right place. So we're just gonna go through the various levels uh, just to make sure everybody has an understanding of 
what we have on the island, and what it brings to each patient. So lead trauma hospital designation uh, in BC and across Canada is something that's uh, granted by Accreditation Canada through their trauma distinction standards. And this was developed in association with the Trauma Association of Canada. And this is how we arrive at the different levels of lead trauma hospitals. We're just going to go through levels one to five. And the slides I'm going to show you are actually specific to the American College of Surgeons, who has perhaps the most comprehensive um, listing out there of what each level of trauma hospital is. Of course, there's regional and national differences, but these graphics will give us kind of a good idea of what we're, what we're talking about when we discuss the various levels of hospital. And uh, they're kind of wordy, the slides, so feel free to pause and take a read through them. A level one uh, trauma center, like I said, is kind of the, the granddaddy hospital, so to speak. They kind of have all services available. They have 24-hour emergency, obviously. But even before that, these hospitals are kind of charged or are mandated with having, um, you know, good QI systems in place to be able to handle all the information and all of the all of the um, particulars of dealing with trauma patients from a QI perspective. And they'll even have, um, you know, prevention programs to try to prevent trauma because obviously that's the best way of dealing with it is for it not to not happen at all. These level one centers will have all the subspecialties uh, available as well. So when we bring a trauma patient in, they'll have, you know, the subspecialties like neuro, anesthesia, ortho, um, maxillofacial surgery, plastics, um, radiology, all of these subspecialties available in-house 24 hours. And that's one of the things that really sort of helps define a level one center is what's available on a 24 hour basis. As well, they will participate in a lot of trauma research and they'll also have the ability to see to rehab and ongoing critical care. And, you know, like I said, as, as these patients go through their, their trauma journey uh, through days and weeks, and they kind of meet a minimum standard of how many patients they see in a year just to help maintain that designation. So if they're seeing the volume, that's going to help maintain a good, um, a high uh, level of care. When we get into a level two system, we're talking about a lot of the same things that a level one system has. We still have 24 hour access to emergency care, obviously, as well as to surgeons and some subspecialties like ortho, um, neurosurge, anesthesiology, uh, radiology, and then of course critical care, ICU care for these patients as well. Now they'll probably have a QI system in place, they'll probably have rehab access as well, but there just might be some things where a level two center isn't set up to to treat uh, specific injuries and those patients might have to be referred uh, to a level one center. But from our perspective as paramedics, we go to a level two center, pretty much everything we need to, to perform the life-saving interventions and get that person um, Onto, onto safe ground is going to be available at the level two center. A level three center um, for us, that would be Nanaimo uh, on the island would be the only level three center. Also has 24 hour access to um, emergency care. And uh, like it says in the slide, it says prompt availability of general surgeons and anesthesia. And I think that's pretty key in that um, trauma is often, you know, the old cliche that it's a surgical disease, which is, you know, true a lot of the time, I think. And this these level three hospitals can provide that care on a relatively um, um, quick basis and, and get these people into surgery, which is what can be pretty important. Again, they'll also have QI, QA uh, systems. There'll be referral centers for smaller places. Again, Mid-Island, obviously, um, there's lots of uh, sort of feeder hospitals that can feed into a place like Nanaimo to, um, to bolster its numbers, so to speak, because they'll see a certain amount of numbers in a level three center as well to help maintain that uh, maintain that designation. And, you know, part of it, like it says in the slide, I think a little bit of outreach and a little bit of networking is important in the trauma system to make sure that it all flows smoothly. When we get into a level four system and level five, I'm going to clump these together a little bit, but a level four system um, or lead trauma hospital kind of differs from the, the previous levels in that it doesn't really necessarily have availability of surgery, uh, especially 24 hours. And that's where it, there's a big kind of line between the level uh, one, two, and three, and the level four and five is, is the availability of surgery. And this is, this is why 
part of why it leads into why we're going to transport patients for a longer distance potentially or for more time in order to get them to a higher level facility where they do have that surgical uh, access. Not only that, but where after the surgery, they have the ability to treat these patients in a trauma ward or with, with, the, with the subspecialties, physicians, nurses, rehab, whatever else stems from um, that hospital admission. They'll have the ability to do that in the higher level centers. A level four center, it might have some of this stuff available, but it's not probably not going to be consistent. And that's kind of where a lot of the issue lies. The other issue would be how often do they see these critical patients and are they set up to deal with it? Do they get enough exposure to that to maintain everyone's, everyone's skills in that particular area? And a level five is basically what we would consider a clinic, um, perhaps a place that's not even open 24 hours, it's call in. We have a lot of those on the island, obviously where these places are there to provide basic emergency stabilization and subsequent transfer out. And, you know, that's not somewhere you really want to be as a trauma patient either. It's just, um, you know, the necessity of our, of how we, how we work in, in the geography of, of our, the island and the smaller islands is that those, those places are the first point of contact. But we should always be considering that those patients really need to be at a higher level trauma center and our whole system should move towards making that happen. So that's just a brief overview of lead trauma hospitals and what the different designations are. Just to round it off, it, currently in BC, there are three level one centers. Uh, that's Vancouver General, Royal Columbian and Children's. Those are the level one centers. Level two centers are Royal Inland and Kamloops, uh, Kelowna General, and then Vic Gen slash Royal Jubilee Hospital in Victoria. They share some services. Victoria General is our trauma hospital, our level two center, but some of the services are, are actually housed at the Jubilee. So there'll be some, there might be some uh, movement of personnel or potentially even patients, but combined they meet a level two uh, designation criteria. And level three on the island here is Nanaimo Regional General Hospital. NRGH uh, is a level three center and they're um, even now working to improve their trauma services. And this all feeds into why we're changing our uh, guidelines for transport when it comes to dealing with trauma patients. And we're gonna uh, get into the, some of that coming up. So I guess one of the big questions that comes up is, Lambert, why have you babbled at me for 20 minutes? Well, I'm getting to the point. The point is that on the island, we're changing the destination guideline from whatever local guideline might be in place about transporting of trauma patients to one in which there is a 90 minute transport time. This means that if you can reach a lead trauma hospital, a level two or a three in this case, so Victoria General or Nanaimo Hospital, within a 90 minute time, it is preferred that we transport our trauma patients to those hospitals. This is gonna have various impact depending on where you are on the island. And that's why we're gonna break it down in a bit about, uh, about who goes where and what the specific boundaries we think as, as, a, as a general rule are. 90 minutes, um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion about that. Uh, it comes from a lot of different places. It comes from Trauma Services BC in collaboration with our physicians in BCHS and consultation with practice leaders and managers and educators. And I think it's an important change that's, that's gonna come uh, to the island. And I say this from both um, my experience um, in critical care and as an educator and sort of seeing how this stuff has played out uh, downstream, I think it's a really good move to try to get our trauma patients to a higher level lead trauma hospital sooner. Now, this also comes from some, you know, credible science and there's a lot of uh, supporting literature in terms of transporting patients to lead trauma hospitals to get them to higher level um, centers and that show that patients tend to do better. They have lower mortality and they can uh, be discharged um, perhaps with more function from uh, higher level trauma centers. But that might not make everyone feel a lot better when you're the person in the back uh, with a sick patient 
that is um, really injured uh, that you're having to perhaps provide some airway support for or perhaps is in a lot of pain. And, you know, asking crews to transport for 90 minutes is a big deal. And this is something that I've been pretty, pretty passionate about making sure is, is heard and is incorporated into, into what, we're, what we're doing when we change these things. So the first thing I wanted to mention was that this is not just taken, you know, uh, this isn't just a random guess at, uh, at 90 minutes. It, it, it comes about from some thought. And a couple of things I wanted to point out. The first is people tend to talk about the golden hour. The golden hour is a term that we've all heard um, for, for a long time. And it refers to the fact that, you know, if we don't get patients to a good hospital, to a trauma center, to, you know, to the hospital within 60 minutes of their injury, then they have way worse mortality. And while that sort of is instinctively true, it's important to remember that, um, that this was brought about by a guy actually named Dr. Cowley um, from Baltimore in 1975. Uh, coincidentally, the year in which lots of awesome things were uh, created. And uh, the golden hour, the whole idea was that let's minimize scene time, let's get them to the hospital as quickly as possible. And that's still a pretty valid concept in terms of, hey, we want to get these patients to the hospital quickly. But it does a, it's a little too simplistic almost in a way because A, every patient is different and what that particular patient needs might be a lot different from, from the next one. Uh, a quick example would be, hey, let's say that somebody gets, you know, has their, has their arm cut off in a, um, you know, freak polar bear accident and that patient needs to get to a trauma center. Well, traditionally we might think, okay, well, we just need to get this person to our hospital and go there. But really, if you put a tourniquet on and you achieve a degree of sort of uh, hemostasis where they're not bleeding anymore, they're maintaining their cognition, they have a blood pressure and they're doing okay, I think it's fair to say that taking that patient to a lead trauma hospital where they're gonna have faster access to vascular surgery, um, or you know whatever other subspecialty might be needed uh, would be better for that patient than just going to to the local hospital and i think that's something where the golden hour concept kind of um, maybe isn't as as powerful as it used to be because i think that honestly as paramedics we've become way better at recognizing what patients need and being able to treat some of this this stuff in in the field maybe not definitively but to have an impact on it Another fact that informs this decision to change to a 90 minute transport time or transport window for our patients comes from a concept known as the trimodal distribution of death. And the trimodal distribution simply rep represents the, the epidemiology of trauma deaths from the time of the incident. So the easy way to think of that is if you look at all of the trauma patients, when were they most likely to die? And their first large bump was, of course, right at the time of the accident, because a lot of people just don't survive or they have unsurvivable injuries or they hold on for five minutes, but they're going to die pretty much no matter what we do or or what else happens to them. The second bump tended to occur about, you know, an hour or two later, uh, where there was a second bump in the amount of deaths that occurred from the time of accident. And I think this is kind of where a lot of the golden hour idea comes from. And you saw this. Um, people who would hold on, maybe make it to the hospital, but they would soon die because of uh, continuing exsanguination or perhaps, you know, they got acidotic, uh, coagulopathic, they got cold, they had all those, all those features of the triad of death um, that, uh, that occurred and they succumbed to their injuries uh, within that time. The third bump tended to occur weeks, you know, days to weeks later, um, more in the ICU or in the recovery phase where people got infections or had complications like blood clots or, or um, bleeding disorders that occur sometimes with prolonged um, hospital stays and, uh, and serious injury. What's been seen since is that there's been a bit of a change where those three bumps don't really occur. And it's kind of more of an initial spike and then a gradual flattening out of that curve. Um, of that curve. And I think that a lot of that is probably attributable to the fact that A, we're better at getting people to the places they need to be. 
that second bump in death doesn't occur because of things like good pre-hospital care, hemorrhage control, keeping people warm, providing TXA, minimizing fluid volume um, that we're giving to people potentially in shock, and getting them to a lead trauma hospital where they're actually going to get surgery and a targeted trauma resuscitation. And I think that's a big factor in what we're trying to achieve with this 90-minute timeline. The third bump also um, tends to disappear as well. And I that's probably attributable to uh, better subspecialty care and critical care and rehab and everything else that goes on, just as our understanding of, of trauma improves. So that's just another piece of the pie that, that, that tells us why we're making this change to 90 minutes. And between the golden hour and looking at how trauma patients tended to die, the general sense is that getting them to a lead trauma hospital right away will generally provide the best outcome for the most amount of people. But of course, that can create problems, especially for the paramedics, because it's easy to come up with this idea and say, oh yeah, let's do 90 minutes and get them to a big hospital. But that doesn't really make you feel much better when you're the only one in the back. And so the next thing we're going to discuss is some tools and sort of how our system can maybe better respond to these patients to give them the best chance, but also to give our paramedics um, the best chance of helping these patients uh, through a better system response and more collaboration. So let's just talk about that. So we've been through a lot so far in this little video, a lot of uh, you looking at my office and listening to me babble, but I think that some, some of the uh, information and some of the lessons are pretty relevant and things we have to keep in mind, especially as we look towards prolonged transport times and potentially being with our patients for a lot longer with these sick patients. So I thought that um, just taking a second to talk about some tools uh, that we can use to help make these transports uh, more effective, do a better job for our patients might be worthwhile talking about. And, you know, I think most of us go out and do a good job and we, we take care of our patients to the best of our abilities, but <clears throat> we always have to recognize our limitations because there's a real difference in, um, in what happens when we're super stressed or when we have that really sick patient. It tends to, it tends to be a much more difficult call with a lot more going on. And I think pretty much everybody at the end of it goes, oh, I wish I'd just done this or that, or there's some part of it that they reflect on. I know that for me, there's, um, you know, what I think I look like uh, when I go onto, a, onto the scene of a call. And then of course, there's what I actually probably look like when I'm on the scene of a call. But <clears throat> despite that, I think that there's some tools that we can use to help make ourselves more successful. And the first one, the first little thing I wanted to talk about was basically, I know we say it all the time, but communication. I mean, communication is, it's easy to throw out there as a word. Oh, you got to communicate. Yeah, okay, I will. But do we really on the scene of a call with a major trauma patient? I think that oftentimes what happens is on a trauma call, our world becomes a little bit smaller. We become very focused and task fixated on what we're doing, dealing with that patient. And we kind of forget everything else that's going on around us and <clears throat> the communication comes in communication between your team that's at the scene and communication with dispatch who's definitely there to support you and this communication can be everything from uh, inquiring if a helicopter is available perhaps the call came in half an hour ago you had a prolonged extrication you get the patient out you realize that they have a physiological or anatomical um, finding that warrants transport to a lead trauma hospital and, you know, maybe now is a time to make sure that we're communicating again back to dispatch and asking for those resources, because in the meantime, something be could have become available that wasn't before, or perhaps uh, dispatch has taken the initiative and found you additional resources. And maybe you just haven't had time to process that or hear that those additional resources are en route and you can communicate some of the, some of the relevant patient information to the incoming crews. So... The communication is a really large part, and I know it's just easy to say, but I would encourage everybody as they go to a call that's a potential trauma to really think about 
to try to find a moment to reflect on how they communicated effectively with their partner, with the fire, and <clears throat> with dispatch and any incoming resources. So the second little tip that I have uh, that I'd like to put out there is simply ask for help. And that might seem kind of trite, like, yeah, of course. But a lot of times, um, I think we tend to get to the scene of a call with the resources that were sent, and sometimes we'll call for help. But I think there's a general sense of not wanting to ask for too much or overreact. And I would argue that in the case of major trauma, this is probably the time where a bit of overreaction is just fine. And that's why we see the guidelines built the way they are, is to make sure that we're capturing um, you know, all of these people at the lead trauma hospitals. In this case, asking for help means not just asking for help for another crew from your town, but since we're faced with potentially longer transport times, asking for help from outside of town that you might not normally think of in the area you work. And for part of that, I mean, if an ACP resource could help, then get them started, even if it's far. If a CCP resource like 180 is available, by all means, let's have them heading off to Comox or Port Alberni if available to assist on bringing that trauma patient to Nanaimo. So there, it's, it's definitely a chance to communicate and ask for the help, think a little bit outside of the box because the patient deserves that kind of help. And when I say getting an intercept coming on, I mean, my idea here is that you have a crew intercept and these guys are there, you've declared the major trauma, you've made that decision. The, the crew that's coming to help you, their job is to jump in the back and get going to the hospital again and assist you on the way. They're, you're not looking necessarily for a consultation from the PCP or ACP or CCP crew. You just need the help in the back during the transport and that's fine. This can be a quick switch over, not a, not a consultation at the side of the road necessarily. I can tell you from my experience in terms of, uh, you know, working as an ACP and a CCP, if somebody has a trauma patient and they're whistling in and I jump in the back and, you know, if all I can do for somebody is help them two person BVM or hand them the suction or everything is in hand, but I'm just there to complete a physical survey. That's awesome. What a win for that patient that somebody else is there to help out. So don't be afraid to ask for that help and get it coming. Uh, I think that's pretty important. So the third piece to quickly talk about is simply self-assurance. You need to be self-assured. You guys need to know that when we ask you to have these prolonged transport times and stay with a patient for potentially 90 minutes to get to a lead trauma hospital or your designated trauma hospital, that you're doing the right thing. And I think we've been through the why. I think that the access to surgery, better access to blood, to a trauma system, more complex care, I think, I think all that makes sense. But it can be hard to remember that in the moment because 90 minutes is a long time. And if you're trying to get to the hospital for that time, it might feel like you're doing that patient a disservice by not going to perhaps a closer hospital, even though it's a lower ranked trauma hospital uh, or clinic. But you are doing the right thing. And that's the message that we want to get across to you. Um, this, is, this is something that's endorsed uh, by management and endorsed by our medical leadership. And it's something that is the right thing to do. And while not every case is going to go perfectly, I think that we need to leave everybody with the knowledge that they're doing the right thing by transporting. You're providing good care and you're making the right choice. And if you use the tools, communicate and ask for some help, I think you are doing by far the best that could possibly be done for that trauma patient. So um, I just wanted to leave everybody with that and uh, give everybody a little bit of a uh, my vote of confidence because I think that we can really uh, come together and do the right thing for these patients, even though at times it'll make us feel a little bit more uncomfortable. So congratulations, you did it. You made it to the end of part one. Uh, that's just going through, you know, a bit of the review of trauma and then into the specific changes that are coming and just those few little tips, um, take them or leave them. But I, I think that's just, uh, those are the things that kind of help us on a call. In part two uh, coming up, we're gonna talk about um, the actual trauma algorithm and get into some specific sort of um, you know area by area walk through um, and feel free to you know skip to your area if you want but I'd encourage you to uh, watch the whole video and just get a get a good idea of um, what's going on on the island for trauma so uh, that's it uh, intermission time. <laughs> Thank you.